Hi, my name's John. Welcome to another edition of History Roadshow. But before we get into today's video, I have some exciting news and something that will certainly be of interest to you and your friends. Insightful Me is a brand new app featuring some of the world's leading content creators, making what you see both entertaining and educational at the same time. Discovering more about the world and its history should be fun and not boring, right? Well, I'm delighted to say History Roadshow has been invited to the party. and I'm now able to give some of you a free and exclusive insight, pardon the pun, into the app. To gain access, simply download from the App Store or Google Play, and I'll leave the links in the description, and simply type into the box, I have an invite code, HRS, in uppercase. So whether you're interested in history, science, tech, travel, art, plus much more, get ready for a whole new world of entertainment. And did I mention, it's advertisement free. Download the app today, it's educational and fun, and become a part of Insightful Me, and feed your curiosity. And with that said, it's time to get back to today's historical tale. Unlike her predecessor, the apathetic Anne of Denmark, Henrietta Maria was a much more capable and spirited lady. England had not seen anything of her type for 200 years when Margaret of Anjou had become the French Queen of the Kingdom with her husband, Henry VI. In a game of baseball, after three strikes, you'd be out. With Henrietta, she already had two against her one for being French and the second for the Catholic leaning. So could Henrietta now stay in the game? Please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to select all notifications so you never miss any of our videos. And with that said, let's begin today's story. Henrietta was classed as an afterthought for the current king's wife when his initial plan was to marry the Spanish Infanta, but Spain rejected that request. The Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers, was the man behind the negotiations. He had strived to get this one over the line after his disastrous attempts in Spain, but it came down to Louis XIII, the excessively refined king, to determine what would be suitable for his sister. Henrietta had no choice in the matter, and she was shipped to England to meet her new spouse, the new king, Charles I. The couple were married at Canterbury, with all the usual splendour characterising these events. Henrietta was 16 at the time, and Charles 23. However, it's said at first sight the couple were not impressed by what they saw. Although Henrietta was small, she still towered over her husband, who was embarrassed by his diminutive height of just 4 feet 10 inches. He could do little about this, but to increase his overall height, Charles would often be seen wearing tall hats and high-heeled shoes. Charles was considered the least intelligent of his family, after being compared to his brother Henry and his sister Elizabeth. He had, like his father, grew up with a stammer. He was a nervous child, but his king would hide his feelings with a bold outlook, yet remain distant to people when the mood took him. But neither of these traits endeared him to the queen. Over time, Charles would find out the lady he had married was a solid and spirited soul. She was not what Charles expected, and he wouldn't have called her promising wife material. Henrietta overlooked Charles daily, refusing to learn English, but would continue to chat amongst her French maids, while ignoring everyone else at court. When the couple married, it was guaranteed that Henrietta could continue her Catholic practices. But this turned sour when she was often found hounding and mocking the Protestant Anglicans. So could things get worse? The king's coronation again was an absurd event. Henrietta refused to attend. Instead, she had a large party at her house. Charles was clearly upset this marriage was not working and he had to find a resolution to this now ongoing problem. Charles decided that he needed to rid himself of her French entourage. He asked Louis if he would accept this in the summer of 1626. Louis had done the same with his own wife's ladies, could hardly refuse the offer. But Henrietta screamed when the royal god took her to a room in St. James's Palace, where they would lock her in until all her ladies had been removed, only to be replaced by English ladies, one of which was the unscrupulous Lucy Hay, Countess of Carlisle, and mistress to the Duke of Buckingham. The Countess was also a powerful woman, she had a wicked sense of humour, and before long Henrietta became great friends with her. Charles despaired that these two had become so close, 
He knew what the Countess was like and if nothing else, his wife was now being dragged down a road she would struggle to come back along. Then more bad news was to follow with the assassination of Buckingham by a man called Felton. He had been returning from France after yet another unsuccessful campaign in his long line of failures. Although Charles was not like his father in that he had male favourites, Buckingham had become a dependable man with a ruthless streak, something the king used to his detriment. But now, utterly alone in the world for the first time, Charles turned to his wife, Henrietta. It would spark something never before seen in the marriage. Love. Between 1629 and 1644, Henrietta would produce nine children by Charles. Maybe miracles do happen. It was the start of a very long love affair, and at last the couple saw eye to eye, and Joy had returned to the court after a long and miserable existence to this point. A storm clouds would once again start to gather, and it was Henrietta who had inadvertently created this downswing in fortunes. You see, Henrietta was also a firm believer in the divine right, something all monarchs of the period had been taught. But Charles, like his father, never fully grasped power and made enemies at Parliament. And although he tolerated Catholics, he would persecute Protestants to the point they left the country. England was now becoming seriously threatened by its own rule, and civil war was on the tip of everyone's tongue. It would be Scotland who was first to throw a stone. Charles had attempted to impose the Anglican Church over his Calvinist subjects north of the border, but Scotland refuted the claim and war looked imminent. But Charles had no money to fight, and so recalled Parliament. But his Parliament had already had enough of his sweeping changes. The best thing for them was to remove the King and his wife. England would soon be divided by the Royalists who wanted to retain the Crown and keep the King, and the Roundheads who wished to be rid of Charles for good. Henrietta quickly realised the potential threat now coming to her family and she took action and the high-spirited Queen was now going all guns blazing. She appealed to the Pope and her brother, although he wasn't much use. In a panic, Henrietta took the crown jewels to Holland to pawn and raise money for the fight ahead. And upon her return, she somehow managed to sneak back into the country before meeting up with Charles at his new HQ, now in Oxford. On one occasion, Henrietta took to the battlefield to encourage her royalist troops, but by 1644 she had fallen pregnant again, and Charles, showing much concern, wanted her move to safety. The royalist stronghold of Exeter in Devon would be where she'd now reside, but the roundhead general Thomas Fairfax slowly overcame the royalist stronghold and made significant inroads. It would be in July that Fairfax captured the area, along with Henrietta. She had given birth but was still recovering when the general called. She was taken to Falmouth onto a waiting ship and set sail into exile, back to her homeland of France. Henrietta never saw her husband alive again. For the following five years, Henrietta contacted everyone for support, but nothing came of her appeals. She was left helpless. Her husband and children were under threat, and the Queen's hands were well and truly tied. In 1645, after the Battle of Naseby, when the Royalists were crushed, Charles fled to Scotland. His children were already under the guard of Cromwell and his Roundheads, and it wouldn't be long before Charles fell to the same group. Charles was handed over to Cromwell in exchange for the cash payment, and the end was now in sight. He would begin imprisonment on the Isle of Wight at Carysbrook Castle. But in 1648, Charles had somehow managed to get the Scots to fight on his behalf, but they were no match for Cromwell, and unlike the last time on this occasion, the Scots were routed. As a result, English royalists were sent to Barbados as slave labour. As for Charles, he was tried and condemned to death. When news reached Henrietta, she left the French court and took no further part in any political activity, now just concentrating on bringing up her daughter, also called Henrietta, and the one son who had managed to escape the bitter feud in England, Henry. Her remaining children fought on in the cause to get Charles some salvation, but Henrietta played no part in this, and her boys would end up scattered around Europe as royal exiles. The Stuarts looked doomed from here on in, but once again fortune was on their side when in 1658 Cromwell died. He had regretfully placed his inept son in charge, Richard, but as his nickname suggests, Tumble Down Dick, he didn't see through his supposed tenure. England was in chaos again with no new leader on the horizon. The people would now speak. They wanted a king back, 
caring not whether the next one was good or bad. After lengthy negotiations, Charles II landed back on the coastline to a wild and wonderful greeting from the folks back home on the 29th of May 1660, which was his 30th birthday. It showed that although a military dictatorship had once ruled with an iron fist, the people of England wanted to get back to a more normal, peaceful environment, and their only wish now was to have a new constitutional monarch, and Charles II fitted the bill perfectly. Once coronated, Charles would send for his mother, Henrietta. She was now the proud occupant of Somerset House and gifted an annual income of £60,000. In 1661, she briefly went back to France to see the wedding of her daughter, Henrietta, to Philip of Orléans. In 1662, she welcomed Catherine of Braganza, the new wife to Charles II. But Henrietta never sat back and openly disapproved of much of her family's relationships. Her husband had always been faithful and considerate and proved to be an excellent father. On the other hand, her sons were the complete opposite, being unfaithful, full of vice and corruption. Henrietta's health began to decline in 1665 when she returned to France, staying at Colombe with her favourite daughter. It was here she died on the 31st of August 1669, the very place she had started out some 60 years earlier. Henrietta had never been on excellent terms with the English and they had never warmed to this French queen. As a mother and wife, she did her best under the most stressful challenges. However, Henrietta was a prominent royalist figure whose perceived influence deepened the rift between the two warring sides. She was a genuine concern for her peers who saw her as invading the male world of politics and threatening the natural order of authority. In some ways, this led to her own and her husband's downfall. <laughs>